I would like you to design a key value store like Memcache. Hi everyone, and welcome to another mock interview with Exponent. I'm here today with Praveen. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Praveen. I currently work with Microsoft in Canada. Awesome. Nice to meet you, Praveen. Um, let, let's jump right into the question. So today I would like you to design a key value store like Memcache. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you uh, Nima, for having me here today. Uh, let's get started. Okay. So just to iterate and understand the question correctly, we are trying to design a system which is primarily going to use for caching. And when I, when I think of any data or any system like key value for caching, we are thinking of two things, which is first, anyway, I talked about caching. Another is the memory. So any caching system is always deployed on highly efficient, but less reliant on uh, hardware. Um, since it's very costly, uh, we need to take some consideration while developing this system, especially that we cannot have all the data in the, the system, right? The reason we have this database is so that we can take some load from our regular databases and have frequently asked query from this caching system, right? Okay, so now let's jump into how and the what are the approaches we can take to design the system, right? So the very first thing which we can do is let's start with uh, the requirements gathering, right? So what I see for any key value pair system, there will be two kinds of requirement gathering. One is categorized in functional and another is non-functional requirement. So for, uh, yeah, let's categorize the requirements into two sections, which is the functional and the non-functional, right? And since we know it's a key value pair system, uh, the two functional requirements would be put and key, uh, put and get. The reason we are having these as the functional requirement because these are the operations we'll be performing on this system, right? And when you think of a put, it will be, usually you will associate any data you are storing in the cache with the key and the value which you are storing. For now, we just, we'll just think of this system as it's storing key and value both as in text. And for get, we'll use or the system service will simply pass the key to get the data. When we think of a non-functional requirement, we want to see except technical services and query queries and all those things. What are things we are taking into account for this system? First thing which comes to my mind is availability, right? That we want system to be highly available because if system is not highly available, then we are doing the same set of all the queries to the database. And remember, if you recall from the start, we want to make sure that the system is the reason we want to avoid all the queries back to the database, right? And it has, it should be scalable because not just having one node when your system is distributed across multiple services, each services eats a different set of cache and you want to divide those cache into different geographical locations. It should be scalable enough and th third thing is it should be performant enough that it's able to take all the operations in the fast manner, right? Uh, now let's get started uh, with the functional requirements and then we'll move slowly to the non-functional requirement and together we'll see how we can achieve both of them. Okay, now before we jump into the functional depth of this requirement, think from uh, how you can design the system for simple computer, simple services as a step, basic step, right? So before we scale down to multiple systems, let's see how you can up implement this for one system. So assuming you have a service here, uh, which, and then you have your database. Okay, now for this service, Let's implement simple cache. Just to do this. Okay. Now this is one simple. We are not going to complicate with multiple servers. Now let's start. Okay. So when you think from key value pair, 
in order to maintain a cache, the very first thing which comes to our mind is hash table, right? It provides, it's, it's efficient in terms of retrieving and adding the data and it provides the get and put functionality which we need, right? So we can have a one cache service A and with the service A and a cache A and we can always, the, the service, this particular service A will be responsible for checking anything into the cache A. If it's not there, it's going to go to the database and fetch it and make sure to update the cache so that next query will be able to get the data from the cache, right? Now let's go back to the hash table, which we discussed. So there is one challenge with the hash table, though it's great for our usage, but that we know the keys in the hash table are always limited, right? We cannot have all the data into the cache. And like we talked about in the very first section that since cache are deployed on a expensive memory, we also want to have consideration of memory usage into the mine, right? So to fix that part, what we can do is we can take something into the cache policies into account. So caching policy is where we talk about how much data will be stored in the cache, how you are going to evict a particular data from the cache, right? And one of the eviction policies we can consider is LRU, which is least recently used. Uh, just to share a few more, there are uh, least frequently used. So anytime you see a cache is full, any particular item which is not frequently used compared to rest of the elements in the cache, you just remove that. And there is one more which we can also consider is first in first out. Any item which was last put into the list, we just remove it in case we see that cache is full. But for the course of this discussion, uh, we can go with the least recently used cache. So what happens in the least recently used cache is anytime you see a cache is full and you have a new item incoming to the cache, you see that whichever item was last used uh, by any request, you just remove that item. Right. And how we are going to do that is if you see that hash table gives us get and post, but the question comes is how do you track which item was used and when, right? Because hash table only provides you key value pair storage, but it does not provide you any mechanism to track which was stored and which was accessed and when. Just before we move on, are there any particular reasons that you're going to pick um, LRU over any of the other policies? Uh, no. So uh, th there is no specific reason. Often it's driven from the business perspective. What's what's the best balance you're able to find? Yeah. If I'll take an example. If, if we're having a website where we want to see based on recommendation system is that what videos are views, how many times we may want to use least frequently used. Right? If you want to show the highly top videos and in those cases. But I, as of now, I think we just want to go with the LRU for this use case. Okay. Sounds good. Just, okay, perfect. So now uh, when we move for the, okay, so what we discussed so far is we can use hash table and in order to take into account that which data structure can be used for tracking, one of the simplest and the optimized data structure which comes to our mind is doubly linked list, right? So what we'll be having is we'll be having a hash table. So this will be a hash table and I'll just make a hash table and okay, and this will be a doubly linked list. So what will happen is that each element of a hash table will map to a doubly linked doubly linked list, and as you as the data enters into the uh, uh, as the data enters into the queue. We are going to ref change the reference into doubly linked list. So I'll just demonstrate with the how three elements will work in the doubly linked list for this manner. So assuming you have, as of now, your cache is limited by only size two, right? And you have two elements into your doubly linked list. So A and B, right? And you know that these, since A was first B was added, then A was added. So anything. In the case of LRU, any item which is newly added, we move to the head of the uh, doubly linked list. So if this is, this is points to your head, right? So now if an item C comes to, I just change the arrow, so it's correct. Okay. Yeah. 
Now when you see an item third is added, which is C, you see that cash current limit is full. So you cannot add that element into the cash. So what you can do instead is you can delete the evict the B and remove it from the cash since it was least recently used. And also just to emphasize on that, you don't have to always calculate which was least recently used the way you form linked list. It's automatically, you know, the last item in the W linked list are least recently used. And the references will be kept in the hash table, so you don't have to worry. So now we just remove the B reference and we add another A. I'll just go it. Okay. And then you add a new node and you add C and you point head to the C. Okay. Right. So this is how the references will work in the W linked list and you will use the hash table. So now you have problem solved for one system. Let's revisit it once. So you have a caching mechanism, service A and the database, and the caching will work with the hash table and the W linked list. But this works only, this works well for the one system, but in real scenarios, we'll have way more system or way many more caches and services. Let's see how we can implement this for multiple services, right? Okay, so let's try to scale our simple approach. So in the real scenario, assuming you have multiple services, Okay, now there are multiple approaches which can be taken in terms of how you put a cache. Take an example, if I'm storing a cache from A to Z, uh, maybe those are alphabetical keys, uh, just an example. Uh, maybe name of the user starts with A and A to Z and then I'm just going to split them into different, different caches. So I can think of cache A will store from A to M. And then I can think of cache B that will store from A to N, sorry, N to Z. Yeah. Now I do have caches and I know these are distributed from the entire dictionary I have for the cache. Now one approach can be that you can deploy these cache A and cache B on a different machines altogether. Right. You don't want to deploy them in the service A, whichever the host is hosting services. Like assuming this is hosted on one, one, uh, one host and the service B is on another host, you can deploy these cache on a different host. And the reason we are deploying these cache on a different host is, okay, yeah, let me take a step back and explain what I have did so far now. There are two ways you can deploy these caches. One is you can deploy them on the same host and the benefit you get out of deploying them in the same host. So I can say service A and cache is deploying on one host, service B and cache B is deployed on another host. And the benefit you get out of that is you, you avoid your maintenance overhead. Now you have only one host to maintain. And also as you scale service A, since it, it has cache A also, it ought it automatically gets scaled. You don't have to add additional hardware to cache A. But there comes a challenge. If something happens to the host, service, so if something happens to the host A, service B will not be able to access cache A because we have deployed them in the uh, same host. So this is one of the consideration that needs to be kept in mind while designing these caches. Uh, also, if you go for the other approach, which I say that you deploy service A on host one, service B on host two, cache A on a host three, cache B on a host four, right? This is also a consideration, but the, sorry, the benefit you get out of this is that you don't have to worry about one host going down and taking another cache also with itself. But another challenge comes is that you have to maintain to a different host but you also get another plus point, which would be that you can in independently scale these caches. Assuming service O is, is running on hardware of 64 GB, but you see the cache is being used a lot. You can just independently independently scale this hardware, right? So these are the two uh, approaches you can take and e all of both of them have their own pros and cons. It depends, take an example for a use case where you see that 
having cash always up and ready is really important. On those particular cases, you can always consider to deploy them uh, on a different machines, right? Uh, on to for, for for probably higher availability, right? So now we have covered how we can deploy our caches. Um, I'm just going to check my notes once. Okay, so this is the okay. So this is the scalable architecture we have created now. But one of the question comes in our mind is the previous section we talked about our LRU algorithm and who is going to do all those things and how are we going to select a cache, right? Now, before we build a component who is responsible for doing all, uh, reaching out to cache and fetching the data and updating the database, those operations, let's figure out how we are going to figure out a cache, right? So in order to figure out a cache, the naive approach, which would be, okay, the naive approach would be, you can always mod the number of forces. So take an example, mod function is something which can help. So assuming you have three cache, right? Now, in order to have three cache, what you can do is you can have a hash function and hash function will take the key in which whatever the key you we, you get from the service and then you can mod with the number of host you have okay so this is a naive approach and the reason i called it naive approach it does work very well but there is a challenge with this approach if something happens to any of the caches, assuming you have three cache, or take an example for this case, since we are talking about two cache, assuming you have two cache, and tomorrow if you're adding a cache C, or if something goes, something happens to cache A and cache B and they go down for any reason, the, map, the hash function will start returning the wrong value. And the reason is, even though it says number of host, which remains, which changes, right? And so you don't get the same answer. So if I change the number of host, I won't get the same answer I got the previously hmm. when I added the cache, because when I added the cache, the number of host was two. So function returns X, but now one server goes down, another server comes up, we have three hosts or four hosts. So the function does not return the same value. So hmm. I'll, I'll go and I'll check the key in the server where it does not even exist. Right? Yeah. So how do we tackle this? One simple way to solve this problem is consistent hashing. Okay. So we won't be going into the depth of consistent, consistent hashing, but I'll give, I'll give a complete overview on why do we use it. Okay. So the goal of consistent hashing is to make sure that it, instead of using this particular hash function, what it does is it draws a circle. Okay, so what it does is it points each cache server as a point on this circle, right? Uh, which is ideally equally distributed across the circle. So what happens is that take an example, if I'm going to draw one, this is my probably cache, I would just name it A and B so that it's easy to read and understand. And assuming you have uh, let's take an example of three caches. Okay, so this think of this circle as an entire range of numbers, right? Which is A to Z and we talked about. So probably A takes care of A to J and then we distribute equally to B and C, right? Now, the main thing which you need to keep in mind here is that the B, sub, B caching server will take care of only the subset key, which goes from A, C to A. And A will only take care of the keys, which goes from A to B. And same for B, it will take care of the keys, which goes from B to C. And now, assuming we have cache D coming into a system, uh, when we have cache D coming into the system, what happens is that if you see, 
nothing gets changed for A and B. The range of key which A was handling and now the range of key which B is handling remains same, right? But there is only a small subset of the change which happens for the C. And that's the whole point of using consistent hashing. Consistent hashing is when there is a change in system, whether cache are added or removed, we want to have minimum minimal impact into the system. In this case, only a small set of key for C gets affected. That's all. And as D gets into the system, the keys will rebuild for D, and those key range will be from D to A. That's all. And you, same if you add another cache tomorrow, probably E, the same goes for E also. B will get only small things, small keys will get affected in the B. Those will be these one. And A, E will be managing the keys from A to C. So like you see in the naive approach, though it was also simple, but if we add more server or something goes wrong into the system, it affects the entire system. But in consistent hashing, it makes sure that only a subset of the keys where new servers are added or removed gets affected and rest of the system remains proper. Okay. Okay. So, so we have the basic approach, hash table doubly linked list. We have the services and we have shown how we can deploy these. We have approach how we can pick a particular cache. But the question comes is who does that? Okay. So I'm going to introduce a new component here. And I will call it as cache client. Okay. One idea is that these services, service A and service B have their own purpose. We don't want these services to be focusing on figuring out where to fetch the data from or which cache to update or where the cache lies, right? So what we are going to do is we are going to build an independent component and this component will probably will be deployed as part of these services. And you can think of them uh, as a library or as a module. Each service here will have an instance of cache client, right? And the reason we have a cache client is because we want to separate the responsibility each component the system is holding, right? And here the cache client will be deployed with every services you have. And based on the number of services on the number of cache you have, the responsibility of the cache client is to find the cache, where to fetch the cache from, which URLs or where, where my cache client or cache servers are hosted, and update the database according to those things. Right? Now, the key things to make uh, keep in mind is that how does cache client gets the name of the cache server, right? So we haven't talked about that part, part as of now. So let's jump into it. There are multiple ways you can always share. Let's say I have two server, cache A and cache B, and they have specific URL. And we know that week tomorrow we can add more caching. So how does cache client gets to know the URLs, right? One naive approach you can always take is have a configuration file which lists down the URLs for each caching server and deploy them as part of CI or DevOps process, right? One other approach you can always take is that the services or the clash or the cache clients fetch these files periodically from a uh, global location, or you can think of an S3 file, right? But there is a drawback to it. You cannot poll uh, too often to the S3 server just to get the list of the uh, caching server you have, right? One better approach you can always take is that you can use an intermediate service like uh, Zookeeper, where whenever a cache server gets registered, uh, it can add a registry into Zookeeper and it's, it's more of a health check and cache client works with the Zookeeper to get the list of an updated cache server. So based on the scenario, uh, if you know that cache server or cache server may not go down or probably it's not that important, you can go for the very first approach, a naive approach, which is simple enough, but has an own drawback. Or you can go for the more advanced approach where you know it's highly critical to have an updated cache 
server list with us so that we can fetch the right data. And also the reason what we want to consider a best approach here is because if your cache server goes down, you are going to have a lot of cache miss. And in that case, all the queries will go into your database. So that can also affect. Okay, now we have we have our uh, approaches in mind. Let's let's go and revisit our requirement which we gathered in the initial part of it. Let's see if if we are able to meet our requirements or not. Okay, so we know we we are able to meet get input because we have a LRU cache with hash table and W link list. We will be able to do get input operations to get the data. Now let's talk about availability. As of now, our system is available, but is it highly available? Can it be available in other others in, in all almost all the scenarios? I would say probably not. And the reason I would say it's probably not is because if you think of as of now, we have only one instance of a particular cache server which is running. So we'll see how we can uh, improve that aspect of availability in a minute. Let's go and check our scalability. Yes, the system is scalable because you can always deploy these caches on an individual host. And we have a mechanism with the help of a cache client that we can add any number of cache. And URLs will be configured with the help of some system like Zookeeper or CICT process. And yes, we have a performance system uh, because we chose one of the best approach, which is Hashtable and W link list, uh, which gives the data a constant time. Right. Let's go back to see availability, right? And see how we can fix the availability part here. Okay. So now take an example. I have a service A here and which is accessing the cache A. Now, how you can make sure that even in even if you're getting a lot of requests to the cache, you can make sure that it's available. So what we'll be doing is we'll adding read replica to this system, right? And the reason we are adding read, read replica. Okay, so just a minute. Uh, okay, so in order to pin system to be highly available, what we are going to do is we are going to add read replica to the cache A. And the reason we are going to do is tomorrow, if cache A, which is the main server, if that server goes down, we know that the URLs or the configurations of read replica is also available with our cache client. In that particular case, cache client can get the data from read replica. There is another approach which can be taken for these read replica is that all the write request, I would say all the put request can go to the, uh, so you can always send put and get request to the main server. But if you want to read and if you just want to read a data, since we know these are read replica, you can always direct only the read query, which is the get query to the read replica. However, there is one thing you, that needs to be kept in mind. And I think the answer to that goes based on how sensitive and important data is for those scenarios. Is Assuming you add something to the cache A. Now we know that as of now, we are just doing asynchronous replication from cache A to these read replica. Assuming you updated a particular name or particular information cache A. Now before the data gets propagated asynchronously to read replica A and B, if cache A goes down and cache client fetches the same data which we just now updated from read replica A or read replica B, you may not get the most uh, up la or the last updated data from the cache. The reason is that because we are doing asynchronous replication, right? Even if the A server doesn't crash, it's, it's th th there will be a chance that you may not get the uh, most updated information to get around this is that what you can do is you can have a synchronous replication between from cache A to these read replica, but you may get slight performance hit in that case because 
unless the rep replication happens to both of these databases, you may not get a response back. So based on how sensitive uh, that informs, I think take an example from a financial systems. Uh, I think in that particular scenario, it's okay to have slightly latency when you're treating these statements, but you want to make sure that statements are correct. So in that case, you can go for the uh, correct information where you have the integrity of the data, but maybe take an example from feed or if there is social media, you're okay to see the view counts and certain things late or probably the next refresh and you can go from the uh, asynchronous approach, right? So this solves our uh, highly availability system, right? And that's where that we talked about data consistency is really important. And often there is no one answer or one, no one solution which fits for all the design system. It's the business consideration that you can take in mind which works for which system, right? Now, there is one thing, however, I want to talk about. We have our system, but we also want to make sure that our system is secure enough, right? In the general practices, you will not be placing your caching server outside of the firewall, and you want to make sure that your caching server will only be accessed by the trusted clients. It can be web services or it can be load balancers, right? And those considerations are really important. And that's where a lot of monitoring needs to happen in the caching server with the help of a log. You want to make sure that who are accessing the, the servers, how frequently these are accessing, how much cache hit and cache misses happening in these services. And you also want to keep track as for analysis and for understanding how much disk usage is happening on these servers so that you have the number. And it's often said that if, if you cannot, if, if you don't have the number, it's difficult to improve it, right? If you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So having measurement is not only important from the performance, but also from the security standpoint. Yeah. So now uh, I'll just uh, probably Yeah. So let's, let's do a, a conclusion of what system architecture we have built and then we'll see from there. Okay. So what we chose is we chose the simple least recently used mechanism uh, with the help of hash table and double linked list. It has performance because it uses constant get input from the cache and those cache servers will be accessed via the help of consistent hashing. Consistent hashing will be placed. All the logic of which service to find, where to find, will be a part of a component cache client. We can deploy this cache client as part of services into a different. So in tomorrow, if you roll a service C, you make sure you can add the cache client to that service. And if you know that in service C, you don't need cache client because it's not going to access any cache, you can simply not include it. And that's the reason we want to make sure that it's an individual component which can be deployed along with the services. And to have a highly scalable and available uh, caching server, we are going to use a read replica and with the asynchronous replication. And we are going to distribute the queries so that we are re reducing the load on our caching, the main caching server. And we'll be doing that by distributing or routing the get queries to a read replica and they get managed asynchronously with the caching server. So this is the uh, uh, system design which, which we can come up with uh, for the key value pair, a uh, similar database or sorry, system design like Memcache. Okay, this looks great. I was wondering, are there any are there any approaches alternative to the consistent hashing one that you've taken, and are there any drawbacks to the one that you chose? Yeah, I think I think that's that's a great question. Uh, though we know that consistent hashing solve a majority of the problem, uh, often there are two challenges with consistent hashing. Also, is that you when you add a lot many servers into uh, the clusters you may not get the even distribution of the keys right some servers will have a lot many keys compared to the rest of the servers with caching servers which you have deployed in the ring and another uh, challenge which comes with consistent hashing is the memory the memory requirement can go up to the number of cache servers you have deployed into the number of multiplied with the number of services right 
So there are a much better and improved version of uh, consistent hashing available, like an example, jump hashing, uh, which aims to solve these problems. Okay, I think that sounds good. I thank you so much, Praveen, for your time. Yes. And uh, I'm sure this is very time. useful to everyone watching this. Is there any advice you would give people who come across questions like these in their interviews? Yeah, uh, I think one of the things that needs to be kept in mind is when you're designing uh, a system like this, uh, make sure to start from the very basic step. It's like, how would you implement this on a very small level, probably with just one service, right? Uh, if you often start uh, implementing or create or uh, having a service, if we can directly scale, scale from the step one, it becomes challenging, right? So come up with a small approach, like we came up with one service, one cache, and LRU algorithm. And once we have that approach perfectly built in, then we can add more server and see challenges we see when we scale this up. Yeah, so hopefully this can help. Yeah, that's good advice. Start small, then build from there. Yeah. Thank you so much, Praveen. It was wonderful having you and good luck to everyone watching. Good luck to all on all of your interviews. Thank you. Nice talking to you and thank you so much for having me. Have a great day.